everyone. Ready to start? Hey, it still haven't been the lunch break. You should have some energy still. Ready? Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the nice thing. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk. Um, we'll be talking about events uh, in this session. Uh, even though I speak Polish, this session is going to be in English. I feel way more comfortable doing talks in English. Um, so um, sorry for that, but given the choice to hear my broken Polish and my broken English, I think you're better off hearing my broken English. So let's go on with this journey in the event land. How many of you are doing event-driven systems? Okay, half of the room, interesting. Um, yeah, we are doing event-driven systems too, or rather we are helping people like you do event-driven systems. And by we, I mean Axonic, the company I work for. Um, and I'm a developer advocate at, at Axonic. My name is Milen Jankov, and I spend quite a lot of time talking to developers about how do they do event-driven systems um, and, and how can we help them uh, do it in a better way. So this is where this talk originates from, and it's a journey as I said, through the uh, event-driven land. And as with every journey, we'll start it at the door. So what you have here is a door. It has an ID. It's 28. And it has a property of color, which is yellow. Wait, it's red. OK, something happened here. Now, notice the change. I said yellow. What happened here? Obviously, something changed, and our state of the object changed. Well, normally, this is not a problem for you, because what happens in the systems that you work with most often is at some database, at some record, um, the ID 28, the property of color, now says red. What you cannot do when you store information this way is you cannot answer these questions. Why it is read? By the way, is it readable from the end? Because uh, I think it's kind of too much light in here, but OK. Sorry, if, if, uh, there are still seats in front if you want to move closer. Uh, OK, that's going to be better. Thank you. Uh, so what you cannot do if you just store state is answer questions like this. Why it is now different color? When it changed it? Who changed it? And what was the color before, right? Those are the, the tough questions to answer if your database says, only says that ID 28 is color of red. But what if you store data differently? What if you store a, an event, a fact that something has changed, so, such like a Joe painted door 28 in red yesterday? Now, if you store that information in such a way, you can immediately answer those questions. Well, why it is red? Because it was painted. Who did it? Joe, when, yesterday. Now, you may have a problem with answering the question of what was the color before. But if your storage is appropriate, is, is suited for storing changes and not states, then you may go back in your history, and at some point, there's going to be an event saying that a yellow door 28 was installed. And since there's no other events between those two, you can fairly easily conclude that the color before the red was yellow. So that's the difference between storing state and storing events. And now that I mentioned the word event so many times, let's go ahead and try to define what an event is. Essentially, an event is a notification that something has happened. It's a message that carries an information about a change, right? Simple, but powerful. Powerful because events by nature are immutable. Hey, don't you like immutable stuff like developers? We, we developers love immutable things, right? It's so, not, it, it, it's so easy to work with immutable things. You don't have to worry about things being changed and, and whatnot. So events are exactly that. If something has happened, it cannot unhappen. Think about it. There may be something else happening that, retur that recovers the state or returns the state to whatever it was before, but that is, again, something new happening. Whenever something has happened, it cannot unhappen magically, 
right? So events are by nature immutable. But they have one more powerful characteristic which Martin Fowler points out. When you do stuff with events, you actually come up with a solution to represent a change within your system, which makes the events a first-class thingamajig. Right? You have a thing now within your system that represents a change. It was like this, and now it's like that. Right? And that is what makes event-driven systems so powerful, immutability and the fact that we can actually now represent changes. So I mentioned event-driven system. Uh, wait. Event-driven systems a few times. Um, I think I missed something with the slides. OK, let's go for this. Um, now let's talk about uh, ways of, uh, of modeling uh, event, uh, event system, event-driven systems. Like, so we have these events, and we want to use them in our systems. So let's figure out how to design the system that uses events. Well, for this, for this, you have actually two approaches. Well, there may be more, but two are like most popular, so to say. The first is event storming. And event storming is a, uh, um, a process that is um, defined as a uh, business process discovery technique, right? You gather all the people that have something to say about things that can happen in your system in a room and try to discover what are the events that can occur in the system. This was proposed by Alberto Brandolini um, a few years back. And essentially what it looks like is a giant board with sticky notes. And when I say you gather all the people, I mean all the people, not just the software developers, but everyone who actually has an idea about the system. And you start brainstorming about this could happen. Why? Because of something, right? And if it happens, what we do? So we have the events of like something changing state or, some, or a notification about something, and then we reason about who is causing it and who needs to react to this. And build, using this to build a shared understanding of the changes that can occur during the life cycle of an application. There is a, a different approach, slightly different, some people say. Some people even argue that it's essentially the same thing. I'm not getting into that discussion, but it's called event modeling. And it was, it's a, essentially a blueprint for a solution introduced by Adam Dimitrik not so long ago. I think I need to go look at the site because I don't remember the 2018. Um, so Adam says, what if we get the events and we put them in a timeline because we roughly know which events occur earlier and which events occur later. And so we create a, a, a timeline of the events and we treat them as the source of truth. So everything that has happened, that can happen in the system is on that timeline, right? So this is pretty much how it looks like. The blue boxes are events. Uh, and then once you have this line, you can also reason about the events and try to figure out how do you react to those events, what components needs to be there to handle these events, what components produce those events. You can even model it up to UI interfaces and, and uh, uh, user interfaces and, and uh, graphical components and whatnot. Right? So this is kind of the, the middle line is the Cluedo. It's the source of truth. It's a, also a design exercise which helps you reveal things that you may not think about otherwise. Example, Adam posted this on Twitter some time ago. They were doing uh, an exercise trying to model a zoo uh, with event modeling. Uh, and they discovered someone suggested this event. Now, I have no idea if that's something that a zoo should handle somehow, uh, right? But the point here is that it, it shows that when you start thinking about systems this way, you come up with ideas, scenarios, use cases that otherwise would be really, really hard to, to reason about. OK, I was telling you about event driven and event modeling, event storming and event whatnot. What is event driven? Let's define, let's try to define that. And that's going to be tricky. So we have this thing event. It's a notification of something has happened, 
right? And it's produced by something. There is a software component somewhere that produces that event, and we're going to call that component producer. And there are components that need to react when this happens, and we call those consumers. Now, what I want you to think about those is roles and not actual components. Don't think of this as being like Java classes or jar files or actual tangible thing, because it's a role. A single component can be at the same time a producer and a consumer in some systems, right? So we're talking about the role they play and not the actual uh, component. So producers produce events and they go to the consumers. How do they go to the consumers? Well, Typically, you have something in the middle that knows how to route those messages because at the end of the day, events are just messages, right? It says message from one component to another, one system to another. And so we have some sort of a message router, and I'm deliberately saying message router and not event router, and you'll see why later. Um, so we have some sort of a message router that kind of knows how to ship messages from one component uh, to another component. Uh, there is enough room in, uh, enough people in this room for some of you to be thinking now, yeah, yeah, that box in the middle, that's Kafka. Right? Okay. Yeah, Kafka can do that. I'm pretty sure a lot of you are doing this with Kafka already. Uh, but uh, just at this point, the only thing I'm going to say is Kafka is not the only solution that can do that. Pretty much any message router will do the same thing. It doesn't have to be Kafka. So another thing event-driven is, is a buzzword. Now, I'm deliberately mentioning this on slides in a positive way. I don't, it's not to make fun of it. It's actually very serious. Event-driven has grown as a marketing term in recent years, right? And it's being used as such in product pitches and sales presentations and you know, pretty much anything but technical stuff, technical contents. It's there, it functions. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you do something that's event-driven and you want to promote your software, you're probably going to use that term because otherwise people will not discover you. Hell, if you go to Accent Framework, which is one of our products, one of the first lines says we do event-driven, uh, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. You can use event-driven in marketing context for as long as you clearly understand the difference about what event-driven means as a marketing term versus what we want to do with software architecture. And when we talk about software architecture, event-driven is actually a false claim. And the reason it is a false claim is because it gives you the impression that events are the driving factor. Everything happens because of events, right? Well, that's not true. Events are notification. Something has happened, and the event is basically informing you about the fact that it has happened. The reason it has happened is a decision. Someone or something made a decision which caused something to happen. And that someone, something can be a human, can be a, a, a if statement, can be artificial intelligence, can be whatever. Right? But the driving factor of any application is the decisions. It's not the events. Events just serves the purpose to notify the rest of the system that something has happened. Another thing event-driven is it's a polysemy. Uh, I'm not, it, or lexical ambiguity. It, it means so many different things that some time ago Martin Fowler did a specific talk about that called The Many Meanings of Event-Driven Architecture. So if you want to dive into this and understand what... So if you get two, two random people from this audience here and, tell, and ask them to you know, explain what event-driven means for them, it, chances are they're going to be both saying event-driven and they will be meaning completely different things. Right? So if you want to explore more in details, I uh, suggest you to watch this talk. It's on YouTube, I believe. Um, I'm going to dive into just a few of those concepts uh, so that this helps us understand the architectural style uh, I'm going to be talking about later on. The first is event notification. Event notification is very simple. It's just sending a message, a short message saying something has happened. That's it. You send a message. Whoever subscribed to receive it receives it, uh, and you don't care. Right? You don't expect any response, as with any event. Uh, right? And we can argue whether the order uh, is, is significant or not. I would argue a lot of times that it's actually not. But 
With event notification, it's like LinkedIn. LinkedIn sends you an email and says, hey, something, someone did something with your profile. <laughs> Thanks, LinkedIn. It would be nice to know who, when, why, right? But if you want to know, you, what you need to do is you actually have to go on the LinkedIn website and check the details. And that's essentially what event notification is. It sends you a notification and says, something happened. And if you want to know more, you have to go to the system that uh, the message originates from and say, hey, I got this notification. Now give me the details. Right? So this is a lot of, go a lot of going back and forth for every, uh, for every notification. And it can be costly. The way to work around that is known as event carried state transfer. So when you do event carried state transfer, you do, you do the same thing. You send a notification, except the notification contains all the data that a consumer needs to do something. Right? So you pack everything you know, and you send it like, here it is, do whatever you want with it. And now, there is no need to have a direct communication back to the system that the message originates from, because supposedly the system that deals with the message already has all the data. So it gives you a lot of resilience, and it gives you, it reduces latency, and it has all the benefits because you don't do all these round trips anymore. But you are in an in a um, eventual consistency world. Now you have two systems that both has have some data, right? And that data is consistent or not. And you don't know most of the time, right? So that's how event carried state transfer looks like. You, you send all the data, and essentially, the consumers are making local copies of the data somewhere. It could be on persistent, it can be memory, whatever the system needs to do. But it maintains a local copy of the data. It doesn't have to be an exact copy of the data. It could be just bits and pieces of it that make sense for that particular consumer. But it still has a, a partial, at least, copy of the data that it uses in a day-to-day -day operations. Which raises a very important question. Where is the source of truth? If those are in sync, fine. If they are not, if you have two systems claiming two different things, which one you trust? Because essentially, that's what you have. For each pair of producer and consumer, you have two sources of truth. The producer has some data that's sent, and the consumer made a copy of it. Right? But if there is something going on during the uh, communication process or whatnot, they can now be in sync anymore. And you don't know that. And you don't know who is right claiming something. So when we do um, uh, source of truth with event notification, we don't have that problem, because we just send short notification, and they go ask the producer every time. So yeah, obviously, the source of truth is on the side of the producer always. right? But when you do event carried state transfer, now you have two sources of truth for each pair of consumer um, and, um, uh, and the producer. So the way to fix that is event streaming. So the idea of event streaming is, hey, we have this message router. So let's be smart, and let's make the message router store the data. Every message that goes through the router, we're going to store it persistently. Right? Essentially, what we create is a stream of messages. Now, what consumers need to do is they need to track their position in the stream. They can say, I've read so many messages. And they can now go on and off and disappear and appear. And every time they appear, they go like, oh, this is how many messages I've read. Give me the rest. Right? And so in this case, what the consumers have becomes a, um, a, a, a copy, a, a, like a local copy of the data that is consumed in the, uh, in the, uh, in, from the stream. Yeah, Kafka can do this. But let's talk about the source of truth in this case. It changes nothing for event notification, because yeah, event notification is simple. But for event carried state transfer, it changes quite a lot, actually. Because now the, 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 the copy of the data that the consumers have is nothing but a local cache, disposable data. You can delete that at any time. If you, if you adopt, just throw it away and go and read the stream again. And the stream now becomes your source of truth, because every single message that goes through that router is persisted there. So 
your consumers can use that data anytime, and they, don't, and they, they can do local caches to do performance optimizations and whatnot, but they don't rely, if, if in doubt, they always have the source of truth in the stream. And if you go look online uh, for these types of architecture, you'll see quite a lot of people claiming that this is how Kafka does event sourcing. And I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that's not what event sourcing is. It's only part of the picture. Because what event sourcing is, is getting rid of the source of truth on the producer side. And now this is where most people go scary, like, no, nah, how, how? How a producer can produce an event if they don't have the data that they are supposed to send, right? Well, they do, but just not from their copy of the data. So let, to, to illustrate this, let's go a little Java uh, uh, discussion here. So normally, imagine for the purpose of this particular conversation, the producer is just a Java class. What you would normally do is you either do it manually or you're going to relay on some ORM mapping magic behind the scenes to do it for you. But what typically happens is you create a new instance of an object, right? Either you manually or some magic goes to some database, reads a row from a table, and then goes from value from that column and sets the field in the class and go from that column and sets the field in that class. That's essentially what happens. And when it is done, your component is ready to, to do stuff. It has a state, right? And it can operate, right? But what you can do is you can do exactly the same thing, but not read it from a database, but read it from the very same stream that you already have. That is your source of truth. Because all these producers, they've sent messages, events in the past. So if they are able to read from the stream, only the messages that they have sent in the past, they can rebuild their state from everything that has happened before. They don't need to store this in any database. They don't need to have a local copy of the data, right? Because every one of them at some point of time started with zero state, right? And then it made a change, and then it made another change, and then it made another change. And if you replay all those changes, you get the state of the component as of today. That's what event sourcing is. And that, what event sourcing gives you, is a single source of truth. Now, the stream in the middle is where everything is stored. Whatever has happened in your system, anywhere, it's in this stream. And that's what we call an event store, right? An event store is a solution that is designed to be efficient in storing and serving uh, events to other components. Now, a lot of people try to implement event stores with traditional approaches. They use databases for that, or NoSQL, or uh, key value stores, document, whatever. That's possible and doable, and I know people who do it, but it's never going to be as performant and as good as an uh, event store designed to do that because of the following things. Uh, yeah, you can do this with Kafka and, and storage, but. Let's talk about uh, uh, details. What, event store, what are the characteristics of such event store? Well, first of all, it is append only, right? We said events are immutable. Ne we never change a content, of a, a payload of an event or of a message, right? We never add a message between other messages. We never delete a message. They're immutable. So the only thing we can do with this is append at the end, right? Now, if you design a storage solution that does not have to care about inserts and deletes and updates, but only does appends, that's a whole different story than a database or a, or a NoSQL uh, something that needs to deal with those things because it, you know, otherwise it's of no use to other people, right? So that is where the major performance uh, optimizations can, be, can happen because of the, the, uh, what is expected from an event store. So what an event store needs to do is it needs to provide a full sequential read. So anyone can go and say, give me all the events starting from zero to whichever is the last event. And that's fine. That's easy to do. Another thing that event store needs to do is to allow components to get so-called replays. So basically get only the events 
that they are interested in, or in another word, subscribed for. Right? So you don't want to go every time to the event store and say, give me all the zillion events that you have, and I'm going to myself pick which one I'm interested in. No, you want to be able to tell, those are the types of events I'm interested in, give me all of those. Right? Now, on the producer side, or an aggregate, if you will, that's a, uh, if you uh, do DDD, uh, which uh, I highly recommend you doing in these types of applications, but on the, let's call it, producer for the, for the purpose of this talk, uh, what you need to do is slightly different. You need to, go to be able to go to the event store and say, give me the events that I have produced in the past, because I now need to rebuild my state. I'm not interested in any other events produced by anyone else. I only care about my own events, so give me those. Right? So it need, now, considering the last three and try to implement those, let's say, in a, uh, in a regular database, well, just the idea of how you store them. Like, you want to do full sequential reads, so probably the best solution is to store them in a single table. Right? But then you want to be able to provide them efficiently for consumers, so probably it makes sense to use table per consumer. Right? But then you also need to do it for aggregates or producers, so it probably makes sense to also have a table per producer. So you can do this with databases, but it's far from efficient. Right? And, and event stores handle this very, uh, a, lot, a lot better because, of their, because of they're designed to do this. Now, another thing that event store uh, needs to support, and initially when, when you hear about it, it sounds like a nice-to-have feature, but if you do production-ready heavy load systems, that is probably the most crucial feature you want to have, is snapshotting. So sooner or later, because if event store is depend only, it it's ever-growing storage. It never shrinks. You cannot you know, do anything to make the data less, right? But, and it, sooner or later, you're going to reach the point where no matter whether you are on the consumer or on the producer side, the events that you have to read in order to build your state are way too many, and it takes way too long, right? So what you want from your event store is to be able to tell, hey, event store, do me a snapshot of when a condition occurs. That could be every 100 events, that could be every three days, that could be every mon mon uh, Monday, that could be end of the month, whatever your business logic is. Right? And then the event store does this for you. At a certain point of time, it's re when you rebuild the state of your component, the event store goes like, oh, that's the time to do a snapshot. Boom, I saved the state. And the next time you go and say, I want to rebuild my state, it's going to actually give you the latest snapshot and all the events after that. So it doesn't have to go through all the zillions of events. It only needs the latest snapshot and the events after that. Um, another thing that event store should have is partitioning and archiving. If you have ever done systems for accounting or financial services, you know they have a good reason to close years, right? And that's just one example. And the reason they close years is because when they do invoicing stuff during this year, they don't care about the invoices from the last year or the two years ago or five years ago, right? But they don't delete those invoices. They still may need them for some auditing purposes later on and whatever, right? They just put them in a different place so they're not on the way on our day-to-day -day operations. So that's another thing you may want to have in your event store, be able to tell, hey, partition the data, so on a day-to-day -day operations, I'm only going to work with the newest events, but I don't want to lose the other ones, I just want to move them to a cheaper storage, perhaps, or somewhere else where it makes more sense. So those are the key features of an event store. And now you have the producers, the consumers, the message router, with the event store. Are we event-driven? Well, as I said in the, in the beginning, event-driven means so many things that pretty much at any point in time you can claim you're event-driven. And so in here, I would say you are very well event-driven, advanced event-driven. And yet, that's not all. Because one thing that happens in, in this case, if you ever reach this point, is that you become too event-driven. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Passive-aggressive events, that's what I call them. 
And it's hard to explain, so uh, I'm going to use an example. So consider this event. Joe ordered to paint door 28 in red. Now, event is a notification of change, right? Of, of something that has happened. Now, what this event notifies you about? Someone ordered something very valuable, right? <laughs> Sorry, what's that? Some, something, want, something ordered something, right? Exactly. What you deal with in this situation is a command. It's not an event at all. It's a command, an instruction to do something that's masqueraded as an event. And we do this because we overdo event-driven. Because when we say we're going to be event-driven, everything must be an event, right? And so we masquerade everything as event even when it is not an event. Now, think about it. When, when we talk about events, we said there's no responses. It's just notification. You send it out. Well, in this case, you probably want to have at least a knack response. You probably, Joe would probably want to know if someone is going to actually paint that door, uh, right? And, and not just shout out to the room, hey, someone paint the door. Fine, Joe, no worries. Uh, right? But that's getting even trickier. Let me show you another example. Joe asked, what's the color of door 28? What this event notifies you about? Joe has a question. Good to know. Right? Well, again, that's not an event. It has no value as notification. It's a query. It's a request for information. Joe has requested to be provided with some data, right? And we masquerade it as an event. We only make our lives harder. Now, try to figure out how to implement this with any message routing system, including Kafka. Right? What you're going to do, you're going to have a topic where they send these events, and then the responses go to what another topic, and then you have to tracking tokens to cor uh, correlation tokens, right? What if Joe was asking about the color of all doors, right? How do, you, how do you design this message flow so that the actual information that Joe needs goes back to Joe, right? And this is where people go like, man, that event-driven thing, it's super hard, right? And it's, 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 it's a huge mess. Well, because we are using it not the right way, in this case, it's not an event, it's a query. It's a request for information. It's a different type of message that requires different routing pattern. So can we figure, fix this? Yeah, if we stop talking about event-driven and start talking about message-driven, and that's the reason I said we have a message router and not an event router, because much like events are messages, we can model different types of messages. We can model a type of message that's a command. And that has different characteristics. It is not routed to everyone. It is routed to a specific component that knows how to handle that command and knows how to execute, right? And it knows that it may need a response. It may need a confirmation. It may need a way to say, no, I'm not going to do this, so some sort of error handling and whatnot. It's a different type of, different pattern of communicating. We can define another type of message, which is query. Now, we still use the same message router, but it, it, because it knows it's query, it would route it to only those components that know how to answer this query. And it could be one component, so just go there, get the results, send it back. It could be multiple components. It could go uh, and send it to a bunch of uh, uh, components and then gather the results, combine them together, and return a single result to the, per to the component asking for it. Again, it is still a message driven. It is still going on. It still can be synchronous or asynchronous. It gives you all the benefits of, a m uh, of messaging, right? but it defines a different pattern for, that is suitable for the types of messages that we are sending and receiving and handling. Now, if some of you may be thinking that I'm talking about CQRS, and if you do, that's spot on. Um, and since uh, the CQRS showed up, let's talk about, uh, uh, about CQRS for a sec. So CQRS 
came up years ago as a simple idea that we should have distinct models for commands and queries. As a matter of fact, when Greg Young introduced it um, first, which was quite some time ago, uh, 2010, uh, the idea was let's just have a class for reads and class for writes, or an object for reads and an object for writes. So all the methods and functions that, state, that change state are in one object, and all the methods that are only responsible for uh, requesting information and, and returning that information back are in another object. All right? Well, things have evolved since then because you know we don't just deal with objects. Um, and we talk about models now. We have a read model and a write model. The reason we have this and the reason this is useful is because of how we try uh, another bias that we commonly have when we design system. So what we do when, when we design a software system? We have a problem at hand. That's a real life problem or something in your mind or whatever. There is a problem in the world that you're trying to solve with software. And first thing you need to do before you can solve it is to model it, to model it with software, to figure out how you're going to represent that thing within a software system. And because we talk about model, single, what we try to do is find that one model that's going to serve all the use cases that we may have with that, uh, while solving that problem. And that one model needs to be performant when we do optimization, needs to update quick, needs to uh, you know, take constraints into account on different invariants. But it also needs to serve the purpose of returning the right data to whoever asks something. And most of the time, we don't even know who's going to be asking for what. So we're just going to add more stuff into it just in case someone sometime asks for it. We're looking for a perfect model to represent the thing, and that n almost never works. But what if we switch our mindset? Let's model the state-changing operations. We only model, have one model that's responsible for making changes, for handling those things in a performant way and notifying the world when something has changed. Right? So we have this right model that, that's responsible for making changes, and that's the only thing that that model is responsible for. Now, for curing purposes, for returning data, we can have one or many models. You can have a model that's, that stores data in a database and, and returns it uh, and maps it to objects, or just returns it as a, um, uh, I don't know, JSON, uh, or, for example, just returns PDF files for, for invoices. No matter, it, it, nothing restricts you. You can have multiple models, and the reason is they're read-only. They never, ever change anything. So it doesn't really matter how many read models you're going to introduce. The chances that you screw up in your system, source of truth, is zero. Right? So you can have as many as, as, uh, as you wish. Right? And then you can have read models that are optimized for particular consumers. Um, so the question now becomes, OK, we have the right model, at least one. Uh, so uh, only one, and we have read models, which is at least one. So we have at least two models, possibly a lot more. So how do we keep those in sync? Well, we're back in square one, right? We already discussed this. That whole purpose of having this architecture with the event store in the middle was because for the reason to have a single source of truth and to make sure that the both sides are in sync, and if they are not, we can actually easily bring them uh, to, uh, in sync, even automatically, without a hum most of the time without a human having to uh, interact with that. So if you want to go this way, you're essentially implementing kind of domain-driven design, which I just touched based on. I didn't have the time to go deeper into that. Uh, event sourcing and secure S. And as it turns out, these three play very, very nice together. And this is what we thought, when, what we have in mind when we say event-driven systems. We at Exonic imagine when we say we do event-driven system, that's what we mean. I know other people mean different things. That's our vision of, of event-driven systems. And now we are trying to help developers build such systems. So if you are to the point of willing to experiment with this for your systems, here is how we can help you. 
That box in the middle, we have a solution for that. It's called Axon Server. It's an event store and a message router. So as a message router, it does the same thing as Kafka and many other, uh, but it also has an embedded event store, efficient embedded event store. Now, it comes in two, uh, uh, two flavors. Accent Server is free to use. Uh, uh, Accent Server Enterprise has enterprise features. It's not free. And Axonic Cloud is the SaaS version of it. Uh, right? It has a, also a free option there to up to a certain amount of events. Uh, so you can also try it in the cloud uh, if you want to. And yeah, that's it. You're done. Right? Well, not really. That's the favorite part of all my talks is those arrows. Right? We're so happy in so many software diagrams that we draw a box, we draw a box, and we draw an arrow, and we're good to go. Right? It turns out these arrows are not implemented automatically. You actually have to implement the communication also. Right? And trust me, I, I think I've seen a lot of times um, the, what is worth implementing an arrow. Uh, it's, it, it can be very costly. So we won't help you with that too. And that is the other product that we have, which is a framework for Java and any JVM language. Actually, a lot of people these days using Kotlin, but it works with Kotlin, Java, Scala, whatever uh, is your JVM language. Rumor has it, something's going on about in the .NET space as well, but I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, but anyways, what Axon Framework does is it takes care of those communication uh, patterns for you. So essentially, it allows you to register components for event, as event handlers, command handlers, and query handlers. So you just annotate your component or your method, say, I'm a query handler, event handler, whatnot, and I handle these types of queries, events, uh, commands, and that's it. It's registered. On the other side, uh, it gives you message buses. Uh, or message gateways, if you will. It uh, depends if you want to do synchronous or synchronous. But, but it gives you a higher level of abstraction. So instead of you just sending a message to a topic and having to define somehow that it's a query or command or whatnot, you have a query gateway, command gateway, event gateway, and just grab it and say, send an event, uh, sorry, publish an event, send a command, send the query, and then the whole routing happens because the components are already registered. The, the uh, router knows who can handle your request and knows where to route it. Right? You can do this in a JVM, in a single monolithic applications. And if you configure it properly, you don't even have to deal with things like serializing, so it's super fast. But then, without changing a line of code, you can extract components and deploy them as microservices, and then you need something like Accent Server in between that does the routing between, uh, uh, between different components. So one of the main reasons why more and more people start looking into solutions like this is when they, when they have legacy code, large monolith-style uh, applications, and they want to extract bits and pieces of them, you first define the structure within your application like this, and now this also gives you the border lines where you can cut, right? If you, uh, when you do the analysis with um, the, uh, event storming or event modeling, that also gives you the boundaries of the objects. Like, okay, those objects are, they belong together, so we should not split them, right? But those, they are not. We can have a com external um, or remote communication between them. So it also gives you the clear boundaries. And when you see a, bound a place where you can cut, you just stack a uh, 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 the, the actual um, uh, communication style there, command, query, or event. Right? And it still stays the same within the monolith. You can deploy it within the monolith and do whatever you want with it. Uh, but then when the time comes, you just get that component and deploy it separately, and it works the same way. Those are the three products. I'm not going to go uh, do some, um, any more marketing about that. Uh, here are the links in case you want to um, uh, learn more. Uh, I'm just going to point out a few other things for those of you who eventually may be interested. Uh, about a year ago, we started working on something we called Exonic Academy. Uh, it's an e-learning uh, platform. Uh, we have some free courses there for um, uh, domain-driven design, event sourcing, and CQRS, and some affordable courses for the products. Um, if, he, if that's something of interest to you and you do the free courses, ping me. Tell me you saw, uh, you saw this talk, and uh, I request uh, access to the rest, and I'll give you one. 
Um, Axon, uh, Axonic Discuss is a place where you can go talk to my colleagues, me, and our community, not only about the products, but in general, about concepts in event-driven, event sourcing, and, and whatnot. We actually have quite some, some discussions going on about whether it's worth doing it in this particular case and, and, and whatnot. Axonic Initializer is, for those of you who are super happy about Spring Start, whatever it's called, thing that you just go on the web page, put your you know, requirements, and it generates a project for you. Well, that, that's the same thing for, uh, for Axon. Uh, and uh, I highly recommend a, a podcast, uh, which my colleague Sarah Tori is doing. And the reason I'm recommending it is because she tries to also speak to those folks that I mentioned earlier that are actually have done some significant world in the field, uh, work in the field. Um, like Adam has been on the podcast, Alberto has been on the podcast. So uh, if you want to hear those folks talking about stuff, uh, also, uh, and you are into podcasts, uh, uh, yeah, you can subscribe and listen uh, to that. That's pretty much all I had for you today. And I really thank you, uh, I really hope it was useful. I thank you very much for attending this talk. And I think we have some time for questions. Thank you very much. So I have a question. Uh, what, uh, because you had, uh, on the end of your talk, you talk about your, your framework, Excel Server, and so on. So I would like to, to ask you, what is the difference? Uh, what are your unique features uh, from your competitors? What, why, let's say, Excel Server is better than, I don't know, let's say, even StoryDB from Greg Young? I don't know if it's better. You know? I don't know if it's better. That what? depends on the use case. I, I actually hate to, uh, to, to do this type of, of comparisons because... No, 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 I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not forcing you to have, but be because I know they even store the B and I would like to know to unique features, what is different or m so what have you done better than, than, uh, than Greg uh, Young? Particularly when it comes to the event store, uh, it, uh, we are traditional Java for JVM focused, so it's much easier to work with the framework than it is with the, from a Java environment, than it is with the work with Event Store. But then, you know, Event Store supports other languages which we at the moment don't, right? So it's, it's all trade-offs, right? I mean, I, I can't, I'm not gonna be, you know, like, oh, we are, you know, this and that. Both are good solutions. Yeah. Uh, in our case, the framework and the server are very well integrated. You basically don't even notice the service, uh, the server, sorry, when you just use the framework and it happens all behind the scenes. In the event store, you have to be aware and, and deal with their paradigms. If that's a problem for someone, it's a problem. Some people just like it and they don't, they don't mind, right? So is it an advantage or disadvantage? That depends on like how particular scenario uh, uh, and, uh, on the particular scenario and how the people who work on that are what they're comfortable with doing right what we try to do is we try to give the Java developers and JVM language developers the ability to stay with the tools that they know a framework right which as far as I know uh, uh, event store does not have all right but it, on the other hand, what they have is a connector, so it, it's not you know rocket science to learn this. Right? Yeah, so. but uh, the, the next question is, is it that uh, to use uh, Excel Server, I have to use your framework, Excel Framework. So I don't. don't At the moment, yes. At the moment, you you do uh, actually you, you don't have to, but if you just want to use the Excel Server alone, then you're pretty much in a situation like with Event Store or even worse because you have to do a low-level communication. So the communication proto protocol between the two is uh, gRPC. So then you have to do gRPC stuff and, and what you can technically, right? There is a Java connector that allows you to talk directly to the server, but it's nearly not as easy as using the framework. You don't have the abstraction of send command query, blah, blah, blah. You actually have to establish a connection, send a message, define what I mean. You know, have to do all the stuff that the framework does yourself. One thing we are working on is a general RESTful API uh, for the server, because a lot of people request this. We've been hesitant to doing it because RESTful means slow, and, um, and, and, and we don't really want to sacrifice performance uh, for this. But it's a huge demand, so we're probably going to have uh, some RESTful API um, uh, soon. Uh, but again, should I recommend that for production? Uh, I don't know. 
Okay, thank you. The, the next question is about the sensitive data. Uh -huh. How do you how do you handle let's say GDPR? Let's uh, yeah. How, so can, that, how, how can I do that? Because I I am obligated. Uh, let's say remove data about some yeah. persons on on. Uh, That's some. a tricky question. Uh, we have an answer for that, which is answer which is the answer in most countries. And um, it's not the answer in some countries because, as it turns out, GDPR is also very tricky. But what you can do is because you uh, you cannot store, uh, you cannot modify the event store, uh, right? But you can. Uh, what you can do is you can encrypt the data. So we have a plugin that's called Data Protection Module, and basically, for any sensitive data, you can pr you can encrypt it, and whenever a user or whenever there is a legal request to get rid of that data, you cannot delete it, but what you can do is you just throw away the key. And by throwing away the key, that data is essentially not, a, not um, uh, recoverable anymore. So the event as such is still there, but the sensitive data that's being encrypted cannot be decrypted anymore. But you have to, let's say, generate the key by a stream. It, well, you generate the key per whatever the legal requirement is. Uh, not, not per stream, just sometimes it's per aggregate, sometimes it's per field. That, that would depend on what actually you consider sensitive data. Question from the back here, the other side. Okay, sir. Thanks. Uh, uh, you can pick, okay, uh, umbrella, uh, Mug or what was it? Or invitation to the Spoina? Umbrella, mug, or invitation? Here you go. I'll leave it here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, as far as I remember, there was no locking on the list of uh, Axon features, but I, uh, I guess that it may still be useful and it would differentiate it from Kafka, for example. So could you please comment to, uh, this? What, what do you mean by locking? Uh, just to be able to avoid that uh, I want to uh, apply two changes to an aggregate in parallel. So uh, if I use Kafka, for example, as an mm -hmm. event store, and I just uh, keep the whole state in Kafka, as far as I know, I, I would be able to uh, somehow apply two conflicting Yes, uh, that, yeah. well, I mm -hmm. think Kafka fixed that, uh, it, but it was the case. Uh, with the uh, Axon server, uh, that does not happen. We have a uh, uh, guarantee for delivery. The, the, so the events are delivered always in the same sequence they were, f uh, they were sent. Right? And if, if, if they're not, that's a bug, but there should be. Right? So you don't have to do anything specifically on your side to guarantee that. The framework and the server uh, are designed to do it that way. That was actually one of the uh, one of the things that uh, some of our customers uh, made some of our customers move to us from from Kafka. But that was some time ago. I think Kafka has fixed that problem quite some time ago now. I mean, I don't know if they fix it or they introduce something else. I'm not a Kafka expert, so I'm not going to make any claims about their products. But uh, I know there was an issue, and the issue is no more. All right, so. Uh, that, did, does that answer your question? Uh, partially. I would say partially because I meant uh, conflicts. So uh, mm, keeping the order of events is okay, but let's say that uh, I, in parallel, two processes, let's say. Yeah, but uh, if you get them one after another, which is yeah. always the case, then it's you to make the decision if it's a conflicting or not. Okay, but uh, uh, Axon tells me that there is a possible conflict, yes? No, Axon will not tell you because, uh, well, it depends what you mean by conflict. Uh, that, uh, because uh, if it's a business conflict, in a business mm -hmm. meaning conflict, Axon cannot know that. Okay, so let's make an example. I have three events uh, mm -hmm. in an aggregate and uh, two processes just uh, pull those three events, build the state, mm -hmm. and make uh, two different decisions, and maybe they may be conflicting. And if I store it in a relational database... Yeah, but that's never going to happen. Because okay. what happens is, is everything is processed in a unit of work. So mm -hmm. the, uh, and now that's on command side, right? When you actually make state changes, right? Because on the query side, 
it, you know, that, that happens all the time. They're eventually consistent, but then you have the ability to restore. What you want on the aggregate side, on, on state changes, is this never to happen. So everything is executed within the unit of work. So if you send a message, or if, for example, uh, you send a command, sorry, uh, and that command results on uh, an error, the whole thing is rolled back. Right? And then uh, it, it, no other command will be processed by the same aggregate before the previous unit of work is completed. And then in the next unit of work, you already have the state, so you can decide whether that is a conflicting change or not. Okay, so that's probably the thing that Kafka still doesn't have and won't probably have. Ever. Okay, yeah, maybe. Okay, uh, again, so it answers the, the question. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, invitation, mug, or umbrella? Mug. Here you go. Here you go. Uh, ah, okay, sorry, go ahead first. Yeah. Uh, a question regarding the uh, schema migration. How would you handle uh, a change in the event schema? So we have a simple oh, wow. field. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a good, very good question. Uh, we don't have too much time to explain it in detail, so I'll be very brief about it, but it's a deep topic. So what we have is called upcasters. All right, so uh, uh, you can, because you cannot change events, and then again, that depend, that's only on the command side. On the query side, you can throw the data, rebuild it, you have no problem with that, right? On the command side, though, there was event happening, happening, they stored in the event store, right? And now you need to change the structure of that event. Right? So from that point on, what you need to introduce is what's, what's called upcaster. So it's another component that, says on the, that, that sticks on the message delivery pipeline, and it basically understands event versions, if you will. And so it, when it reads the event store, it reads it as like, OK, that's version 1. All right? But now my component is expecting version 2. So on the fly, it converts it. Right? Now, that typically works very well when you have not a lot of upcasters, right? Up to certain amount, it should be just fine. You're probably not noticeable. Now, if you end up having hundreds and thousands of upcasters, that's probably better to actually take the system off, run this thing one, and update the events in the event store, and then move it back because, you know, with, with upcasting all, you know, on every read from the database, that would be... That uh, will be performance. Uh, there will be performance penalty for that. But the infrastructure for doing this is there. So is caching. So is a bunch of other things, which you know I don't have the time to go into technical details in here. Uh, in, invitation mug or umbrella? A mug. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, great talk, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I have one. Uh, in, in fact, two questions. So uh, you said that uh, the event uh, stream is immutable, right? This is the... No, the events are immutable. Event, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, but sometimes because of the bug or something like that, uh, it, uh, somebody could send the yeah. uh, invalid event, let's say, the mm -hmm. client uh, one was deleted, and how you can deal with this kind of situation because you can... Yeah. remove this kind of yeah. e e event. So this is the first question. And also I have a question about the Spring Boot and uh, uh, Axion framework. Uh, is it possible to use them together? Or Most of the people are using Spring Boot together with Axion framework. Okay. Like most of the people who use uh, uh, Axion framework are using it with Spring Boot. Okay, so ax uh, this action framework is like additional, right? So yeah, this is uh, and actually Spring Boot makes it a lot easier to wire things mm -hmm. because with, uh, if you do it with plain Java, you still have to do some configuration, uh, like, you know, call Java, yeah. blah, blah, yeah. blah. With uh, um, Spring, Spring Boot is just annotations. Uh, so most of the people actually are using it with Spring and Spring Boot. To your first question, uh, let me, ask, let me answer with an example. So you go to a bank and you ask the cashier to transfer uh, uh, 100 zloty. But she makes a mistake and types one more zero. And instead of 100, transfers 1,000. Right? That's an error. Right? No one notices. Right? It happened. The transfer went for 1,000. How do you roll it back? The answer is you don't. 
you have a compensating action. You acknowledge you made a mistake, right? And then bank has a procedure that re requires the money to be transferred, to, you know, transferred back. It's called a compensating action. Right? You perform another operation that mitigates the wrong result of a previous operation. Now, that's how you do it in general in event sourcing. You don't change the history. You don't pretend the error didn't happen. You acknowledge the fact that error happened, and then you take action to fix it. There are very few cases where you don't want that, and that's, for example, if you do a registration, and that's why I just uh, you always use this example just to illustrate the purpose. So if you do this, for example, for user accounts, right, and you have a registration process, and users put their emails, and they create an account. Well, you don't want to do a compensating actions for two people registering with the same email. Uh, right? That would be tricky uh, right, to compensate. Right? So in this case, we also have tools that are different processors that are actually not executed remotely and asynchronously, but are executed within the same thread. And then you can configure it in a specific way to say, for this particular operation, I need to do exact uh, uh, key-based validation. Uh, so you have a, a dictionary of unique values and check, for example, right? But those are edge cases. We can handle those, uh, right? But most of the time, most of the errors that people occur, those are recoverable or compensatable. They just like, don't want, instead of, w w most people, instead of acknowledging the error and compensating for it, would like to pre uh, pretend there was no error at all, right? And that's generally not a, a good approach. Uh, invitation mug, I, oh, I don't know, I have limitation on mugs already, so umbrella or? Umbrella. Umbrella, okay. Uh, Okay, 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 go. Uh, if we need to stop it, uh, because, oh, it's a lunch we break, right? Lunch, so okay, yeah, we can talk. You don't have to eat, you right? You don't have to eat. <laughs> right. Okay, go ahead. Uh, when you say that an event store should support snapshots, uh -huh. what do you mean exactly by that? Uh, I, I imagine every cons uh, co consumer has a different uh, snapshot. In, so. Yeah, the consumer is providing the structure of the snapshot. Uh, so basically, in our case, uh, I spoke generally about event stores. I don't know how all event stores do it. I don't even know if uh, uh, event store does it and how it does it. I can tell you how we do it. And by default, it's uh, serializing the object. So we know that if you've read all these events and you've cre created an object, a Java object instance, right, then it's the, your state as of this moment, right? So we just can serialize that class, uh, that, that object, and store it in the, in the database, uh, in the event store. And then the next time we read, we're just going to deserialize it right, and apply the events after that. That's by default. Obviously, there's an API you can change. Uh, uh, if you don't want to use default serialization, maybe you want to do JSON. Or, but as the, at the end of the day, it's the aggregate that needs to if you don't do anything, it's going to use the default, but you can configure your ag aggregates to tell the system how you want them to be uh, serialized to be stored as a snapshot. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, go ahead. Uh, probably about uh, Exxon Framework. Okay. Uh, let's assume that we have two producer of the answer for the query. Uh -huh. And uh, will uh, Axon Framework uh, orchestrate this uh, response for query that includes two of the source for the answer to the question? So, okay, so you... Or you have to do this manually? So uh, you, just to make sure the mm -hmm. question, uh, understand the question. So you have someone asking a query, sending a query, mm -hmm. and you want to collect responses from multiple components. Yes, exactly. Okay, so we actually have three types of queries. So we have a, um, 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 a regular query, which goes to one component, mm -hmm. right? We have a subscribing query, which you say, I am asking this now, but I want to subscribe, and if something changes in the future, let me know. Okay. So you're subscribing for answers, and you're constantly updated. 
And the third type of queries that we have is called scholar galler query. So in, and when you send a scholar galler query, you're basically saying to the, the, the infrastructure, now I'm sending this request and ask anyone that can know the answer. Mm -hmm. And when they respond, collect, their, uh, the, collect that together and give me the answer back. Okay. So, so that, that depends. What the functionality that you're looking for would depend on the type of query. You would, you would have to explicitly say that you want a scatter gather query. Okay. This is probably the third one is answer from my question. Okay. So, okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, one more question there. To even, uh, okay. use the, uh, Can you start events? over because I didn't hear the beginning. Sorry. Yeah, I, I have a question about the usage of the event uh, domain like solution, mm -hmm. and what is the condition, business conditions uh, that we have to meet to even start thinking about the usage of the event domain in oh, our projects? My favorite question. <laughs> so now, if I want to be mean, I would ask you, what is the condition to use Spring Boot? Like, you know, people mm -hmm. stuck it everywhere and they don't even think about it. Uh, but that's not the point. The thing is, we get, you know, when we start understanding certain things and patterns and, mecha and mechanics, we kind of see their applicability everywhere. So I'm the wrong person to ask this because I'm familiar with this. It's, I know how to work with this. It's convenient for me. It does not cost me any pain, right? Mm -hmm. And if I were to start pretty much any system, to, to build any system tomorrow, I would start with this because it gives me a lots of benefits and it doesn't cost me any pain, all right? But it would be naive to assume that that's the case for everyone who was in this room, uh, right? So uh, that de sometimes you would have strict requirements uh, that demands uh, using these types of systems. Sometimes you do it just because that's more convenient. I have another talk. Which, uh, in which I'm doing a demo about um, a shopping cart, a simple shopping cart, mm -hmm. right? Which you would never think of like implementing it this way, right? And we actually had a similar case. It wasn't with a shopping cart, but uh, essentially what happens is you design it, you throw products in the shopping cart, you remove them, you purchase, done, well. Two years down the road, your product manager, and, and at this point, when you think about that system, you would probably not consider using this approach. Right, because you would probably, or maybe not you, but a lot of people would say that's an overkill, right? But two, do, two years down the road, your product manager comes to you and say, hey, we have, or business folks come to you and say, we have this great idea. Let's give X percent discount to every single customer who considered buying a product but didn't. So they put it in the shopping cart, but they didn't finish the purchase, right? And now, if you only have a state stored system, you basically say, yeah, fine, man, but you should have told me this two years ago, right? Yeah. Okay. With the event sourcing approach, you can just build a single component that goes through the event stream and, and rebuilds. And that, by the way, doesn't have to be done with Axon. It could be also done with Kafka or any think event store, um, uh, if any event storing messaging solution, right? But it opens the door for you to solve a problem in a future that today you don't know you have, right? So asking me, I would say always, right? But for a lot of people, that's the wrong answer because they have a solution to deliver tomorrow and they want to choose the tools at hand that they already know. So it's, it's, really, hard to, um, it's really hard to give you a, um, like a, a checklist. Like yeah, if yeah that is un understandable. Yeah. Uh, but could you recommend some information sources, some knowledge sources uh, to get more about the, the event uh, domains? Academy. Okay. okay. And, um, yeah. I mean, Google, essentially, the Internet's full of things. The problem with Internet is that uh, probably the ratio of high-quality uh, information versus crap information is like one-to-one. -one. Um, so, you know, sometimes you, you read stuff that, that really sounds like it is wow, and it turns out that, you know, I, and, and, and sometimes it's, it's the opposite. So, yeah, we try to curate the data there. Ping me if you, uh, if you uh, go through the courses and you want to learn more, I'll, I'll, pro I'll try to provide more resources. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I'm curious. 
I'm curious about unit testing. Do you have to spin the Axon server to some testing? No. Or? We have actually a testing framework, which is part of the framework. Uh, and what we have in there is essentially, uh, um, uh, how it is called, the uh, uh, given, uh, given when then approach. So, sorry? Ah, okay. Um, uh, so basically what you're saying, like, if such data exists, well, that's my state. When this happens, a command query, blah, 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 I expect the state to be this, right? And that's essentially testing the entire flow. Okay, so I, I don't care about the details of the actions framework. I only test my aggregates if they behave as I want, yeah? Well, I mean, you want to test that the right events are published, okay. right? Because that's essentially what defines the, what the state of your aggregate will be, because it will read its own events later on. So eventually, what you want to test is like, if I say, um, if there is a add product to the cart command, I want to test that there is either product added to the cart event, or there's some exception that you know something something went wrong, right? The, or you know, uh, in case if you have a compensating action uh, or another thing that's something else, right? But that's essentially what you want to test is that your aggregates because and that's essentially the only thing you test because that's the only thing that makes changes to the system is that they process commands properly and they produce the outcome you expect them to produce given the the payload, right? And for this, that's all you need, essentially. It's uh, given when then, and that's it. Thank you. Not sure if I, I'm allowed to give any more of those. <laughs> Last question event. Uh, or message. There, there's more? Going in free. Two. Oh, Thank cheers you. Cheers don't ask questions. So. <laughs> Thanks, folks. <laughs>